First, I mean, the first question I've got to ask you about this album is I'm just, um, I wonder if you're surprised about how well this album seems to be doing all, in all the polls recently. There's so many polls that are is sticking you right up there. Uh, that must be quite, uh, um, quite welcome, really. It must be um, interesting for you to see how well it's doing. Yeah, I, I think well, you probably know us quite well by now, but um, the, the object was always to make something that we felt every track had a reason for being there and there were no yeah. fillers every every note was meant you know so that uh, by the time we got to the end of it i can remember actually getting to the end of the mixing and and steve and i just looked at each other and we went <laughs> that's it you know so we knew that we couldn't do any better so from our point of view yes we're absolutely thrilled with yeah. with what's happened because we are kind of punching above our weight to an extent yeah. i think yeah. as an independent Definitely. Um, but you knew you knew from the get go that you'd made a bloody good album. <laughs> yeah, we were very lucky. I mean, you know, the fates combined. Really, we we'd gone through um, a difficult period. You know, we'd, we'd lost Frosty, uh, who we all love very much, and um, and Zoltan came in and was amazing. You know, and uh, I have to say that since I mean, I think you're coming to the Arundel gig and um, mm -hmm. the gigs that did by the time we got into i think gig three i just thought well this is just incredible you know looking at, at what the boys had done and how good you know we just ended up laughing while we were playing because it was, it was so ridiculous yeah. Yeah. yeah beautiful I mean, I mean are you seeing uh with the the popularity of this album and all these different polls are you seeing that's translating to audiences or do you think audiences are a little bit reticent still due to covid and things like that well, I, th I think there's two sides to this, actually. I think it would be, first of all, whether it transfers into sales. I'm not really seeing that. We just carry on as normal, really. Okay. And then on the other side, with audiences, um, yet yeah, gradually, it, it, it's, a very, it's a very, very difficult thing for all bands, not just, ju just for life science, but I think for any of the, uh, of the newer bands, whether they're young or old, um, it's very difficult to, to hit the mainstream of people that enjoy the kind of music that we like. It's, yeah. it's almost, I, I said to Steve Hackett once that, uh, you name drop, but you know, if we could lock his audience in a room and then put life size on stage, they'd probably love it. And also if you put Frost on, or if you put any of, you know, so many different bands. Yeah. Um, but it just seems that there's this kind of, I don't know, almost underlying cutoff point that, that, that comes with, yeah, I often click, if you look on Facebook, sometimes you get somebody that likes you from the States, yeah. who's never heard of you, just found you, they live in Utah, and they've got 5,000 friends, and none of them are your friends. But yeah. out of those 5,000 friends, there must be people that like the same kind of music, but yeah, yeah. they're yeah, yeah. You know, just not open to what you're doing. And I don't really see that, I think since we lost things like the old Grey Whistle Test, and you know, DJs like Tommy Vance and John Peel, and, and, and you know, bless him, Alan Freeman, you know, we don't seem to have anything that connects apart from people like your good self, you know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I noticed when, you know, when you put up something about what we were doing, people took note and, and we need more people to, I suppose we would have to regard you Barry as an influencer. You know, we need more people. To, to, <laughs> well, you still, to you still owe me that beer, by the way. I do. And I will <laughs> repay you. <laughs> Well, you know, I've had a, 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 there's been quite a buzz about this record. I did this review of this album, uh, obviously, which I've got here, you kindly sent to me. And there has been quite a, a response uh, on my channel to it. I mean, one of my patrons, um, who's not usually a prog fan by his own admission, you know, he uh, much prefers uh, rock and roll. Sorry, my screen's gone off a bit. That's okay. No problem. In a minute. Right, uh, uh, rock and roll, and but he said he really enjoyed this album. So there's, uh, you must be doing something right. But well, I don't think we specifically fit into the prog genre, to be honest. I think we okay. do, we do prog things. I think the first album was quite proggy. Second one was a mixture of prog and pop, probably. Yeah. And this one is kind of prog, pop, and jazz fusion. Yeah. And uh, you know, we're really enjoying that some people are starting to compare us to UK and 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 and. Brand X and Bruford and things like that, you know, which of course we all enjoy. Yeah. Um, but and the market might not be quite so big for that either. So it's, you know, but it, oh. it's something, I think it's, um, David Payton said something to me um, a while ago. Uh, David Payton uh, worked with Alan Parsons, was in pilot for those that don't know him. He said, everybody wants to be in that band when we did a live show. Yeah. I thought, 
you know what? I've always wanted to be in this group. The fact that this group is is nowhere near as as popular as the bands of the past isn't really anything to do with it. I just want to play music that I think is 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 beautiful with friends that that I'm astounded by. And so you don't really need, you know, it's not about sort of achieving. Somebody said, would you like to be famous? And I said, no, not at all. I said, I'd just like to be heard. Yeah, and yeah. that's the yeah. difference. And I think that's what a lot of, you know, not just us, but an awful lot of people face at the moment. Well, it's interesting the, with uh, social media, with YouTube, uh, everybody can now be a celebrity to a certain extent. Uh, but yet no one can be a celebrity. It's like just white noise. There's a line in the film, one of my daughter's favourite films, Incredibles, when we're all special, none of us will be. And it's a bit yeah, like that, really. And it's, it's interesting that bands like yourself have to find a way of operating in a different way, looking for outlets, perhaps like my channel. I mean, Marillion uh, T-shirt I'm wearing at the moment are a band that seemed to have done very well after yeah, EMI uh, ditched them. But it, yeah. it's just finding, um, I, I don't know what the answer is, you perhaps know better than I, but it's just finding niches and platforms, really, to try and get yourself noticed. To an extent, I think we took the Marillion template and we uh-huh. kind of transformed it into to what we think it needs to be currently. Um, yeah, yeah. Not saying that, they, you know, not, I mean, they've, they've got a brilliant mechanism and they've got mm. astoundingly loyal fans around the world, yeah, which is absolutely. one. And that's really kind of what you have to build. I mean, people, people, um, you know, turn their noses up a little bit when we said, well, the album's 20 pounds, you know, um, and, and we're completely independent. So we just do it ourselves through the website and through a few yeah. dealers and other bits and pieces and um yet we've not had one person who's bought the album who's complained about the price you know so this is the funny thing is that there's this kind of juxtaposition well all albums are nine pounds 99 well no if we want to put value back into music we have to start somewhere and if you compare if you compare it with inflation then albums should be 50 pounds you know Um, I I, i remember buying cds when they first came out uh, we're going way back to about 83, 80, and I remember paying like 15 pounds for a CD then, and I was only earning yeah. about 60, 70 quid a week, so that was a lot of money then. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm starting to stretch out further into uh, into sort of newer prog bands. I've been reaching out to a lot of newer prog artists. Uh, I, call, I call them prog artists. You might disagree with me. <laughs> to say, send me your album. It sounds a bit cheeky, but send me your album so I can listen to it, review it, and, and put it on uh, on my channel. Dave Bainbridge is, is a chap that uh, he plays on your album. You sent me his album. And he's probably getting a bit impatient waiting for me to do something, but it will <laughs> be coming as soon as I get uh, the time to do it. Um, it's incredible. Uh, time. Sorry? He's an incredible talent, Dave. He's amazing. Oh, great, because I mean, the guitar playing on this, I mean, I, I listened to it like just yesterday and the musicianship and playing on this from, from everybody is just absolutely astounding. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it sounds so good as well. Uh, I don't know who did the production on it, but the, the sounding, is it you? Well, on altitude, oh, no, it's yeah. um, myself and Steve Rispin. Yeah, the two of us together. Just, um, a, lot of, a lot of people on my channel might be wondering who Life Signs actually are. I mean, if you could uh, summarise... <laughs> Kind of who you are really or is there a, is there a um an ethos uh, around the band or um, um who are life signs it's a very good question um it life life signs started as a kind of um a challenge it was just yeah. I, I was i was in a pub and i said um to some friends we were talking about progressive music and it, this was the early 2000s and I said, I didn't feel it was progressing. I said, I didn't feel like there was much coming along that was making me, there were lots of things that sounded like comfortably, but not many things that really pushed me and made me think, you know, which I'm pleased to say there are now. Mm-hmm. And um, so somebody said, well, if you can do any better, do it. You know, so it was like the red rag yeah. came down. Okay. And I spoke, I spoke to Frosty, who'd been with me in the John Young band about doing it, and also to Nick Beggs, uh, who's a neighbor of mine, and we're really good friends. So. Um, and we agreed to make the first album. And so we didn't have a guitarist. So we approached Steve Hackett and um, Steve was lovely. He said, um, uh, he, he played on two tracks and we said, well, we only wanted one Steve. And he said, no, no, he said, but I was enjoying myself so much. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. We, that was a good start, you know. And there were lots of people that we approached. Nobody, nobody turned us down. Everybody wanted to work on it. The album received um, good praise in, in, in prog circles, probably the proggiest thing we've done. Yeah. And Robert 
well, Robin Bolt was probably the main guitarist on it. I was only talking yeah. to Robin yesterday. He's a he's a brilliant talent. But all the people that we've we've kind of at the core, rather than the guests, so to speak, are are generally people who've worked for other people. So what mm-hmm. happened was when the when when sort of punk came along in 1977 and the door was just closing and we were all trying to to grab the last bits of what was happening. Um, everybody then was booked, you know, people like myself and Dave Kilminster, Nick Beggs and everything else. We all ended up working in other spheres and we all ended up working for other people. So there yeah. was this general bunch of musicians that were just kind of session guys that were go-to guys. Yeah. One like, like Lee Pomeroy with, you know, Anderson and, and, and Waitman, you know, I mean, uh, Lee's been in so many, he's worked with me with Bonnie Tyler. We've all worked for lots of different people. Mm. And I think it was those people that we went to to say, well, why don't we do something ourselves rather than having to work for other people? Yeah. And that was how Life Signs kind of formed, really. And I think mm. that was the ethos behind it was to make the music we wanted to make. And um, Nick, unfortunately, left after the first album, but immediately John Paul came in, who is just monstrous. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, that's been the, the sort of core of the band through, through the years until... Um, Frosty's now gone and Zoltan's come in so it, it is it, it's a kind of um, I don't know a movable feast to an extent yeah. because everybody has to work with other artists so we all have day jobs working for other artists yeah and life science yeah. is something we do in our spare time I did say to somebody on Cruise to the Edge a few years ago I said how many of these bands are professional and aside from the ones from the sort of 70s and whatever yeah. There weren't that many bands that were actually on the boat that, that did it for a living, if you know what yeah. I mean. So yeah. I think that's that's always the, the goal is that if you could just do it for a living, it would be amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's um, they once said of yes, that uh, yes is essentially Chris Squire and whoever else turns up. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering, uh, would you say life signs essentially gravitates uh, around you? Are you kind of that Chris Squire figure? Um, that's a very nice compliment. Uh, I'm a massive fan of Chris Clare. So, um, oh, absolutely. But, but yes, um, I, I would I would say that probably time has made it that way. You know, it, mm-hmm. it does seem that obviously, um, you know, I mean, I'm the, the lead singer and the keyboard player, but it's it's quite strange. I just got this keyboard player thing with Prog Magazine, and and I'm not the best keyboard player in the band. Dave Bainbridge is the best keyboard player in the band. So you know, it's just I think we're surrounded by this talent. Yeah, and just for me, it's a joy to work with such marvellous musicians, I have to say. It's a wonderful yeah, thing. Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned in, uh, you were talking about in the in the late 70s, of course, punk slammed mm. the door shut, really. John Peel was a huge champion of uh, punk. Yeah, yes, he, indeed. Yeah. Absolutely derided prog. I mean, I think he described Emerson, Lake and Palmer as a lot of piffle. Um, <laughs> Uh, what, what did he famously say? What a waste of talent and electricity, he said. Uh, that's <laughs> um, but um, um, I'm just wondering, though, I mean, if you listen to some of those later prog albums as you get to the mid to late 70s, do you not feel that door perhaps needed to be slammed shut for prog oh, to go away and, and, and rethink what it was doing? It was just getting a bit too... Completely. I, I, I think that... Um... You know, looking back on it now, I look at it very differently to how I was as a teenager coming through. Yeah. You know, it was I discovered progressive music quite late, and by the time I was getting into progressive music and jazz rock, yeah, yeah. then it was all kind of caving in, and I was like, no, you know, no. But now looking back on everything, I mean, yeah. John Poole is our finest example because he thinks there shouldn't be any genres at all, yeah. and you know. John can play anything. He can have a, a conversation with you with regards to Jean-Jacques Burnell and, you know, obviously Jean-Jacques Burnell's favourite bass player was Chris Squire, and, you know, and all the different things that you get from all the things that, that were good that came out of every single thing that happened. And to be honest, I think the way the record industry worked, because I was booking gigs for, a, for a, a club in Liverpool at the time. And so we were putting on in, 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 punk stroke new wave acts and I remember, you know, this, this included things like the Eurythmics, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thinking, okay. hmm, are you sure about this? You know, and I mean, yeah. I'm not even sure the police come in, into that. But it was just, that was the, the, the avenue to get a deal, you know. So yeah, everybody absolutely. that was, you know, I, and I, I think that's been the, ca- the case well, pretty much in all genres, really, to an extent. Uh, I was going to talk about um, uh, Altitude, uh, the title track. I mean, it's absolutely fabulous. Um, I love the cello on that, by the way. I really adore the cello. I wonder if you, wonder if you could talk a little bit about the title track of the, the album. Um, well, I, 
I compose in a very strange way. I, I, mm. I do this thing called channeling, which is just where I just turn off and stuff arrives. And I know other people do it, and I know people find it a bit weird. It's quite spiritual, um, mm. but it's something that I really believe in and something I've learned to, to um, understand um, more about it over the years. I've been to TEDx lectures about it. I've been to all sorts of things. But basically, the beginning of the song, um, the whole idea with the music at the start, it's quite Vangelis-y, I think, in a way, at the beginning, is, is that it's underwater. The drone is underwater, and then it comes okay. up above the water. Oh, okay. And then all of a sudden you're flying, and the flying is 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 beautiful. You know, it's just about this. And, and when I was writing the song, I only had that bit. I only had this beauty of flying because I'm a big aviation buff, so I, I really enjoy um, anything to do with that. So there I was in the clouds, <laughs> and then kind of then the channeling took over, and I'm playing away and I'm singing along, and all these lyrics are arriving, and it went target destroyed. And I went what? <laughs> you know. <laughs> I had no idea that all of a sudden this was a drone that was killing people, you know, and, yeah. um, and the story then just evolved from there because initially it was just a short song okay. and this whole thing, this, this other stuff just all arrived about how the guy would feel. Uh, and strangely enough, I saw a movie not long after that because I went through the whole thing of in my head of, you know, you just released a drone. You just, you just kill all these people <clears> and you go next <throat> into a bar and get a burger you know and how would that how would that affect you and, and what would it do to your mind and um and then i saw a film that had exactly that premise which was yeah. was i can't remember what it's called now but i just thought this is just such a strange world to live in you know that this this kind of distant warfare okay. but it's an interest it's a fascinating number and there seems to be a bit at the end of it where he's uh, he seems to establish a relationship with a, a girl somewhere else I don't know if I'm wrong here. I don't know if he actually does establish a relationship, whether it's just in his head. Um, that's what I'm a little bit confused about. Uh, is it? Have, have I got that right? Yeah, I think, um, I, to be honest, I often have to ask, after I've written something, I have to ask the questions uh -huh. as to what it was about myself. Um, so, for yeah. instance, when we did Card Cardington, and I was doing, and um, and I, yeah, I came up with, the, the line came, the skies are green. And I said, what does that mean? I've got no idea. And, of course, with an airship, you look down, you don't look up. You okay. Know. That was the, this all had to be. And the thing I love about it as well, Barry, to be honest, is, is that also people like yourself and other people come to me and go, it's about this. You yeah. Know? You go, oh, right, right. I'd not thought of that. I'd not thought of that aspect or so somebody will bring a different aspect into it. So I do love that, the, the way these things develop. And I, I, I think, you know, I understand the song. I know what the song means. And at the end, yes, there is a love affair. And there's a sadness tinged with the last two solos, the synth solo and the violin solo is, is very tearful at the end. You know, yeah. I find yeah. very moving, very moving. And to a point that for the live show, we decided, well, we'll keep that and we'll just fade out. You know, I know that when Steve Hackett does songs, he fades out. And I think it's yeah. a beautiful thing to do, although everyone likes to stop. You know, it's yeah. just it's really lovely the way it just evolves. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I must get back onto the questions. What else do I have for you here? My scribbled notes. Free to um, uh, would you would you say there was a thematic link between uh, the title track and the rest of the tracks on the album, or is it just a kind of a random collection of songs? Um, no, not really. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's not a link as such. Um, I think you have a fancy you... concept album. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that the whole thing that got me to do this in the first place was that as a teenager, I went to see The Land Lies Down on Broadway and I just thought, I want to do that. You know, I uh, just yeah, watched, yeah. watched the show and just thought, this is amazing. And just inc how incredible Genesis were, you know, especially uh, during those times. And I think that was the, that was the catalyst for me that, that then took me on to, you know, well, this is what you want to be. And, um, you know, it was I'm very fortunate. It's, it's with a lot of people that I know, we've all been lucky to work for great artists, but we're always, you know, a few feet away from what's going on. Um, and I find that, um, you know, the, the things that I really enjoyed as I was going through, I went from like Genesis and the things like that. In, I got into Weather Report. I got into, um, you know, Stanley Clark. I got into uh, UK Bruford Brand X everything else and then I, I really enjoyed things like Asia I enjoyed the re the, the reinvented yes I, yes I liked you know the aspects of all the different ways that you could do things and I think there was a particular period of time when I was starting to visit America more 
in the beginning of the 80s and stuff where you couldn't turn on the radio without hearing Phil Collins or Genesis or, or you know, it was Michael Mechanics. It was just, there, there was so many things that, you know, then you, you've got MTV and you've got Van Halen and everything else. There was such a plethora of great music around. Yeah. And now it seems to have, you know, tailed off. And it's very sad that I saw some people discussing on, on I've gone off piece myself now, but I saw some people discussing on Facebook the other day that they preferred a tribute band to the original band. Yeah. They said, tribute band does it better and I thought is this how far we've come where because <laughs> you know, when I was a kid it was like if you said well I didn't manage to see because there were no no tribute bands so you know, if you if you saw a covers band or something you say oh never mind you might see something original tomorrow and now original seems to be at the bottom of the pile no. which, is, which is very very strange so I, you know make a concept album my goodness getting back onto the question um I, I'd love to I don't know whether I've got the the problem with the concept album to an extent, I did write one many years ago, which just sits on a cassette in my, in, in, in my studio. Um, but the thing is that you then have to stay uh, on target for the entire frame of the, of the album. Whereas with a piece, you can just do that, that 15 minutes and you're done, you know, yeah. but then with, if, if altitude was a concept album, then the next piece would have to be about that and about that and about, and I think I'd find at my age, I'd probably find that a little difficult. <laughs> uh, what was it like working with John Wetton? Um, do you have any, do you have anything in the can or any co collaborative material that, you know, has yet to be released? It's funny, actually. I, I saw a thing um, that Jeff Downs put up um, saying that he'd got some unreleased material with John. And yeah. it suddenly got me thinking that I might have a cassette of something somewhere that we've done. I know there was tracks we worked on for Archangel that never made it onto the album. Uh -huh. um, I'll have to find them, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it was weird. I was a massive, as you know, I was a massive fan of, of UK and I, I enjoyed John's work with Crimson and um, I was a big fan of Asia. And yeah. uh, and um, so my, my break with that was that I was working in the MTV band in London and mm -hmm. um, we had various guests, Van Morrison, people like that. Um, funny enough, Nick from Cutting Crew. Um, and then John came on with Phil Manzanera. And, oh, okay. um, We'd, we'd done all these tunes and everything else and I was I'm, I'm quite shy actually in, in those situations I didn't say anything and I, I remember mm -hmm. getting getting home and I thought cool you've just played with you know the guy that you've bought all these records and you didn't even say hi you know yeah, yeah. and then on, on the Monday I got a phone call from Asia's management and they said have you heard of a band called Asia and I said yes of course I have and they said well you start Friday <laughs> and that was it <laughs> and uh, so obviously John had seen what I'd done and and um and made a note of it uh, jeff was busy working with um with greg lake at the time yeah so i ended up doing two tours with asia uh, in 89 and 90 and then um john and i started collaborating on tracks and we did a track together for battle lines his mm -hmm. original album and then i co-wrote half of the archangel album with him and the thing i remember about john is that it's just there's certain people that there's just, and you must have seen this as well, Barry. There's certain people there's just genius in them, yeah, you know? yeah. and it's just wonderful to watch because sometimes they don't even know they're doing it, you know. Yeah. So I remember going to a sound check, and John was um, playing his bass. He was trying his bass out. He was dabbing his bass pedals at the same time, nothing to do yeah. with playing the bass, and he was holding a conversation with one of the crew. <laughs> and I just yeah. thought, I'll never be able to do that. You know, yeah, that's, that's yeah. beyond me completely um and you know we went through good times and bad times but you know john john to me is somebody that i always look up to as being an incredible talent and yeah. um you know one of probably one of the best rockers uh, you know you know in the things that we like he's probably one of the best <laughs> writers and, and performers that, that i've known you know 